We've been hearing a lot about the so-called Bush tax cuts from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Uh, given the rhetoric being used by some on the other side to describe this tax relief, uh, I would like to take this time to correct the record. But first, during this talk about the fiscal cliff and about the tax cuts at sunset at the end of the year, all we've been hearing since the election is about what are we going to do about taxes. That's a very significant thing as a result of the last election because I think it's a foregone conclusion there's going to be more revenue raised. But if we raise the amount of revenue that the President wants raised and raise it from the 2 percent that he wants to raise it from, the wealthy, that's only going to run the government for eight days. So what do you do the other 357 days? Or if you look at the deficit, it'll only take care of 7 percent of the trillion-plus deficit that we have every year. What about the other 93 percent? So the point being that we can talk about taxes and taxes and taxes, but it's not going to solve the fiscal problems facing our nation. Uh, we don't have a taxing problem. We have a spending problem. And so we should have been spending the last three weeks talking about where, how we're going to take care of the other 93 percent of the problem. The President should have declared victory three weeks ago, and we wouldn't have had all this lost time between now and right after the election. But I said I wanted to set the record straight. The tax relief reduced the tax relief of 2001 and 2003 reduced the tax burden for virtually every taxpaying American. It did this through across the board tax rate reductions, marriage penalty relief, enhancing certain tax provisions for hardworking families, such as doubling the child tax credit. Since the passage of this tax relief, there's been a concerted effort by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to distort the truth about the present tax policy of the federal government. That tax policy has been in place for the last 12 years now. They have attempted to distort the truth behind its bipartisan support, its benefits to lower and middle income Americans, and its fiscal and economic impact. As one of the architects of the 01 and 03 tax legislation, I come to the floor to correct what I believe have become three common myths about this tax relief. The first myth is that this tax relief was a partisan Republican product. The second is that the tax relief was a giveaway to the wealthy. And the third is that the tax relief is a primary source of our current fiscal and economic problems. First things first, we often hear that the other side divisively refer to this tax relief as the Bush tax cuts. Given the rhetoric on the other side, you would think that all the tax relief was forced through a long party line vote. The record proves otherwise. The conference report to the Economic Growth and Tax Reconciliation Act of 2001 passed the Senate by a vote of 58 to 33. In all, 12 Democrats voted for this legislation. Senator Jeffords, who later caucused with the Democrats, also voted for it. As far as major pieces of legislation goes, it's difficult to find such major legislation passed with such broad support since there has been Democratic control of both the Senate and the White House. The President's 2009 stimulus bill, as an example, only had the support of three Republicans as well as the Dodd-Frank bill. And of course, there's the health care bill, the President's signature legislation, which passed with no Republican votes. Moreover, all the 2001 and 2000 tax relief was extended in 2010, just two years ago with strong bipartisan support and signed into law by this president. At that time, two years ago, the Senate vote tally was 81 to 19. 
Now understand, that's got to be considered overwhelmingly bipartisan. So just two years ago, we had overwhelming bipartisan support for the Bush tax cuts. Yet somehow, these are a, a partisan measure that we're dealing with. Given this record, instead of calling the Bush tax cuts, as they are called, we really should be calling it the bipartisan tax relief. I now would like to turn to the other side's criticism of the bipartisan tax relief as, as they say, tax cuts for the wealthy, or another way they say it is, a giveaway to the rich. This rhetoric demonstrates a difference in philosophy between this senator and my Democratic colleagues. First of all, a reduction in tax rates is not a giveaway to anyone. The income of a taxpayer earns, belongs to that taxpayer. It's not a pittance the taxpayer may keep based upon the good graces of our government. The burden should not be on the taxpayer to justify keeping their income. Instead, it should be on us here in Washington to justify taking more away from them. Secondly, there is a tendency on the other side to view everything as a zero-sum game. In their mind, if someone has more, it means someone else will have less. So I'd like to quote Ronald Reagan as the best example of this attitude in Washington. Too many people in Washington, quote, can't see a fat man standing beside a thin one without coming to the conclusion that the fat man got that way by taking advantage of the thin one, end of Reagan quote. I believe this is what is driving the animus against the so-called wealthy on the other side. They're under the impression the wealthy got rich at the expense of someone less fortunate. The problem with this view is that in a free economy, goods and services are transferred through voluntary exchanges. Both parties are better off as a result of this exchange. Otherwise, it wouldn't occur. Moreover, wealth is not static. It can be both created as well as destroyed. At worst, the government is a destroyer of wealth. At best, the government is a redistributor of wealth. It is through the force of government the zero-sum exchanges occur. It is the private sector that creates wealth through innovation and providing goods and services we need and that we want. The leadership on the other side has become fixated on redistributing the existing economic pie. I believe the better policy is to increase the size of the pie. When this occurs, no one is made better off at the expense of anyone else. The constant rhetoric of pitting American against American based upon economic status doesn't have to be doesn't happen to be constructive. It also has not been constructive to accuse those of us who support the present tax policy for all Americans as somehow agents for the rich. And I'll soon get into discussing why that isn't true as a result of the 2001 and 2003 tax bills. I do not support tax cuts for the wealthy for the purpose of wealth redistribution. I support pro-growth policies to increase the size of the economic pie. Free markets, pro-growth policies are the only proven way to improve the well-being of everybody. My objection to the other side's characteristic characterization of the bipartisan tax relief is not only a philosophical one, but it's a factual one. The truth is, the bipartisan tax relief that was voted in 2001 made the tax code more progressive, not less. Now, with all the rhetoric around here over the last uh, five or six years, 
Nobody believes that, so I want to show you, and I got a chart to show that. Since its implementation, the share of tax burden paid by the top 20% has increased. Conversely, the bottom 80% has seen their share of tax burden decrease. Additionally, the percentage reductions in the average tax rate between 2000 and 2007 was the largest for the lowest income groups. As you can see from this chart, there's a general trend downward for the bottom 20% to the top 20%. The bottom 20% saw their average tax rate drop by a quarter. In other words, that 25% shown there. The top 20%, on the other hand, only saw an 11% reduction and proportionate in between. The truth about the bipartisan tax relief apparently has not been recognized by my colleagues on the other side. They do not like to admit this, but this must be so since they now claim to support extending 75% of that bipartisan tax relief bill. In other words, 75% of what they're condemning of the 2001 tax bill, the other side wants to make permanent law which obviously I support, too. You would think that if it really was a tax cut for the wealthy, however, the other side would be ad advocating letting all of this tax relief expire. Certainly, certainly you would think they would be advocating for more than half of it to be extended. To get around their seemingly contradictory position, they have stopped referring to the majority of the bipartisan relief as the Bush tax cuts. That term is now reserved only for the 25% that they wish to see expire. They now refer to the 75% not as Bush tax cuts. They uh, refer to it as middle income tax relief. So I have news for my colleagues. The middle class tax relief you now claim to support is the same relief you previously demonized as tax cuts for the wealthy. Finally, it has become in vogue for the other side to blame the bipartisan tax relief for everything from the federal deficit to the state of the current economy. Neither are based upon fact nor sound economic reasoning. It is undisputed that in 2001, the Congressional Budget Office was projecting a 10-year budget surplus of five and six tenths trillion dollars. However, as of, as of June 2012, CBO reports show the bipartisan tax relief role in turning this projected surplus into deficits is dwarfed by other factors. This is the Bush, or this is the 2001 three tax cuts. So see that smaller piece of the pie. And then let's look at what else is the justification, according to the Congressional Budget Office, not this senator, about where the deficit came from. First off, the June CBO report tells us that their budget surplus projections were incorrect. Now that happens a lot with CBO. I like to refer to CBO around here as God because what they say goes and you got to abide by it if you don't have 60 votes. But they aren't always right, so they aren't always quite God. But unlike God, CBO then is not omnipotent. They do not have perfect foresight. And every once in a while, they even make mistakes. CBO's surplus projections were based on rosy economic assumptions, as well as faulty technical assumptions that did not pan out. CBO failed to predict the bursting of the tech bubble 
And that was that tech bubble was so beneficial to propping up the economy in the Clinton years. CB also could not predict the 9-11-2001 tragedy that hit New York and the Pentagon, killing 3,000 Americans. That 9-11 wreaked havoc on our economy, and that wasn't predictable. So add all these things up. All told, these and other economic and technical changes accounted for about three and two tenths trillion. Or as I show in this chart, these faulty assumptions accounted for 27% of the change of the 2001 projections from surplus to deficit. By far the biggest reason for the change from surplus to deficit was an increase in spending. Some of this spending was justified. This includes bipartisan support for increased spending to protect our nations against future terrorist attacks. But of course, it has become the custom around here. We spent and spent and spent some more. This spending not only continued, but escalated with the election of President Obama. His first act was to increase the deficit by 800 plus billion through a failed stimulus package. And all this increase in spending accounts for nearly 50% of the change from surplus to deficit. That's this part of the pie chart. So how about the tax cuts we hear so much about, we hear so much belly aching about from the other side? If you look closely at my chart, you will see that I have divided the tax relief into two slices. These two slices add up to about 24%. 11% of this, which I labeled all other taxes, primarily consists of the tax relief provided in President Bush's 2008 stimulus package, <laughs> President Obama's 2009 stimulus, and the payroll tax holiday are included here. Of course, these provisions had large Democratic support, as we all know. That leaves us with the 01 and 03 tax relief accounting for merely 12.9% of the change in the projected surplus. But understand what other people are saying, including I think even the President saying, about the reason we have this big budget deficit is because of the Bush tax cuts. Well, that's baloney. It's a far uh, cry from being the driver of our deficits or even a substantial contributor. The truth is, even using CBO's static scoring assumptions, tax relief did not push us into deficits. In fact, if the only change since CBO's 2001 projection had been the 01 and 03 tax relief, we would still be experiencing sizable surpluses each year. Along with blaming the bipartisan tax relief for deficits, my colleagues on the other side have alluded to this tax relief as being the cause of our recent recession. The President even made this claim in an ad during the presidential election. Now the exact logic of this claim escapes me. Apparently it also escaped Washington Post fact checker Glenn Kessler. He described the reasoning supporting such a claim as a Rube Goldberg phenomenon. The Post was unable to find any respected academic study supporting that convoluted logic. There is good reason the Post could not find such a study. The focus of most economic research in this area focuses the degree to which tax increases lower economic growth and tax decreases increase economic growth. There is considerable debate within this research, but it's difficult to find any suggesting that tax increases are good and decreases are bad for the economy. Now that I have explained these myths to you and hopefully corrected these myths, I hope that we have a more constructive discussion on averting this fiscal cliff. 
Republicans have already stated they're willing to accept some new revenues. Speaker Boehner has put $800 billion in new revenues on the table. However, we still not have heard from any substantive ideas from the President or other leading Democrats about cuts to spending or entitlement. We haven't even heard the President say good things about the Simpson-Bowles recommendations, a commission he appointed, a commission that had Republican and Democrats on it, a commission that reported that had re uh, conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats saying we ought to do what we can to s see the Simpson-Bowles approach through. It'd be nice to see the President endorse a recommendation of a committee he appointed that was, had a suggestion for taking care of this fiscal cliff problem. If he'd done that two years ago, we wouldn't be debating fiscal cliff today. So there are serious concerns on my side of the aisle that any agreement we reach will result in immediate tax hikes, but promised spending cuts never occurring. We need more than just empty promises from the other side. The President and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle need to get serious about looking at the spending side. It's time for the President to make good on his campaign promises, supporting his words, balanced approach to deficit reduction. And let me repeat what I said at the beginning. All we've heard for three or four weeks now since the election is all about taxes. In fact, too often, that's what Republicans are talking about, although you've, they, they've got to be considered now as a result of the election. But if we give the President everything he wants in the sense of the uh, t uh, tax on the wealthy with the figures he wants, still runs the government only for eight days. What about the other 357 days? It only takes care of 7% of the deficit problems we face year after year after year, and it's going to be year after year after year into the future if we don't get something done about it. So what about the other 93%? The taxes aren't going to take care of that. You can't tax us out of this deficit problem because we have a spending problem. So if we'd put as much time into the spending side of the ledger that we put into the taxing side of the ledger over the last three or four weeks, we'd be well on a road and be certain to get out of here by Christmas Eve, which I have my doubts that we can. I yield the floor.